Good afternoon. I want to introduce you to, uh, this is in their words, and I want to introduce you to a fine guest and fine artist and a character and a half, <laughs> Doug Wallace, uh, who is, uh, this will be a, a dancing kind of conversation, <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> as opposed to many other we have. Uh, you get to see some of his wonderful artwork and uh, see uh, the covers of a couple of his books. And he also uh, does uh, the paintings, which you're going to also see. And um, a ba great background. Welcome to In Their Words, Doug. And uh, explain who you are a little bit. Well, thank you, Steve, and thank you for having me on the show. You're welcome. Um, yeah, explain who I am. Well, that's that's a philosophical question. Right, right. No, we've had enough <laughs> philosophy in the last show. All uh, right, yeah. Well, I, I think that uh, you know, I'm an artist, you know, of probably different kinds, and uh, art's been my life in, in various forms, from writing, music, painting, etc. Right, and I did mention you are also a musician that had uh, a band in the past, you and your wife and others, I'm sure. That's right. right. And uh, so you have that musical... Uh, character and heritage too. Yeah, love it, love it, and don't have enough time to do it all. It's always a juggling game, you know, to juggle these art forms. That, that was the old rock too, wasn't it? Yeah, it was yeah. rock and roll, yes, that was absolutely. was real yeah. rock. Yeah. Got a little rock and roll still right. in my soul. You were an, you, uh, now, I wonder, you know, seeing your paintings and stuff, mm -hmm. do you think you incorporate uh, that kind of thinking in the paintings? There could be a little bit of that in there. There's certainly a, a musical theme in some of the paintings, and uh, particularly because my wife, well, she plays both the piano and the guitar, but, um, but because she's a great musician and because we have other female friends that are great musicians, mm -hmm. I've taken that and, and sort of in, and made paintings that are sort of the woman and guitar kind of theme. So mm -hmm. you will see some of that. Yes, if we, we if we have a let, let's take a look if we can with the uh, four paintings at the beginning of this series and uh, if we can we get Venetus up there it is girl with a hat Venetus yeah uh, the the Venetus paintings are actually they've been around for centuries and uh, the Dutch in the 16th and 17th century were doing a lot of these uh, Vanitas I think is the Latin term for that Vanitas uh, okay. And uh, yeah, and, and they're basically about the impermanence of life, and uh, they're symbolic paintings, and, uh, and as you can see in this one, uh, there's a lot of symbols that, that look at the transience of life, uh, the futility of pleasure, uh, the beautiful woman here that's uh, embellished with jewels, the hourglass, sands going down, the flowers dying, the candles going out, uh, and, uh, and the, the death figure right behind. And so it's all symbolic about how, how impermanent life is. Uh, this kind of a series, how old is it? Did it appear in well, they, uh, they go back 1600s? Or? Yeah, primarily the Dutch made them a very popular genre in the 16th and 17th mm -hmm. century, but they, the Vanitas type of paintings have and sculpture too have existed for centuries, you know, even before that. And what was the form you used in this? Did you use oil? It's oil. It's oil on a canvas. And... Uh, and I wanted to address that, you know, I mean, because it's something that we're all facing on some level, oh, yeah. and uh, it's, it was an interesting idea for me. I wanted, because I liked a lot of the early paintings that I'd seen the Dutch do, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to do my version of that. I like uh, maybe going along in the same genre is Queen, which would be the next painting up. Queen, Queen is, is a little bit different in the sense that there's, there's no vanitas type of theme there. Basically, it's, you know, I was interested in, in the old icons uh, from uh, the Byzantine period, Russian icons, when, and it, the, the, they were so beautifully done with sort of jewel technique. And I wanted to sort of capture that same thing, but I wanted to do it in my own way so that it wasn't like a religious icon, but yet it was something that was kind of surreal, both surreal and yet it drew from the past. I think uh, that after that explanation, I've seen this before, mm -hmm. but I see what you're talking about. Like some of the uh, intonations in the painting are from the Russian Orthodox Church. Yes, they're, they're, you see those, those. those influencers are there, that's right. How far back would that be? Oh, I, that goes back again, centuries, yeah. Really? I mean, I initially, I've had an interest in Renaissance art and, and Gothic art, you know, throughout my life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I always like to incorporate a little bit of the fantastic in things, too. Writing, painting, whatnot. Never, mm -hmm. never have anything that's completely realistic. Part of your fantasy life. That is it, <laughs> yes, right. Well, let's take a look at the next one, if we can. Uh, the Tree of Love, uh, which I like the name. 
And where are we going here, Doug? Well, we're, we're really dealing with the, the sort of the interconnectedness of all things. So we're all part of the same tree. Even though we're molec our molecular structures are a little bit different, at, at, the, at the bottom level, we, we are the same thing. The tree, the plant, the bird, the beast, uh, the female, we are all interconnected. We're made of the same stuff. And mm -hmm. that's thematically what that painting is. So this is kind of like one of, you'd say, a life tale of yours? I, it could be called a life tale, it, but it's an expression of unity, you know, because mm -hmm. in the world that we live in, there's all this separatism, you know, it's this, this group and this group and this color and this color, but yet at, at ground level, we are the same thing. Yeah, we, we are the matter. Particularly now. That's right. It's important. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, paintings, I think uh, I've read and I believe that getting into the culture of things, being painting and music art in different other forms, even for the individual out there, the audience, uh, is important in times of stress. Okay, let's take a look at the next one and you, uh, the primal ooze one if we can. <laughs> it looks like a baby there, isn't it? Well, yeah. it is a baby and, and actually the genesis of this goes all the way back, uh, oh, decades for me. And I was actually, and I'll be brief as possible, but I was in a swimming pool in Daytona Beach late one night, wondering if I could remember what it was like to be in the birth canal. Oh, really? Yeah, and, and I, I figured I had a memory of that, but I had never accessed it. So when I drifted underwater, I began to sense, the, sense memory that that was coming back to me. So that's your birth canal. So that was, that was it. It was me coming out of the birth canal into the world. That's why I call it Escape from the Primordial Ooze. That's wonderful, you know. It's wonderful that you can depict something like that whether it is, it is probably from your memory or partially so. Yeah, no, it is part. that was the, at least the genesis of that. Mm -hmm. So did these four works follow, uh, particularly these four at the beginning, we're showing four together. Mm -hmm. They follow any interconnectedness or any theory you have in particular? They, you know, here's what drives, here's my driving motor for painting. And it changes from time to time. You know, it's, it's I want to, I have an image or something I want to express. Mm -hmm. Whatever that is, it's the most powerful thing going on with me at the moment. That's what I paint. And if, it, if it's a series, like I've done a series of women with guitar, that was important at the moment. But then there's something else comes along that mm -hmm. I want to create. And, and that's the driving force. So I just go with that, whatever that is. If it changes up, it changes. But you always do it in a, a, a set of themes like that? or not? not? Not always, yeah. Sometimes it's conceptual, sometimes there's a theme, sometimes it's, it's wanting to create something that's just simply beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are all very lovely. Uh, l let's take a look at the next four before we jump to the books. So the first one uh, would be Time's Arrow, called. Okay, this is a little bit of the same theme of the Vanitas painting. You, mm -hmm. you might see that. And, and it's, a, again, about, you know, the impermanence of life and a little bit different depiction, uh, but you can see that there are leaves falling, the dying leaves around the, the figure, the melting clock, of course, uh, the balloon has burst. And, and of course, it's a, people always ask me about the little stinger on the end there. What, it, what is it? How does that connect? And, and that's really that we carry the stinger of, of the end within ourselves. So uh, it's, an, it's an expression of that about the impermanence of life and the shortness of the brevity of life. I think I would have missed that myself. I mean, you're right, because uh, research, new research in science proves that there is a mutational gene somewhere that is the end. Mm -hmm. I believe that, yeah. Yeah. And you're kind of depicting that in a painting. That's right. In various ways. And it's like the, the little skull balloon. It's when the balloon burst, mm -hmm. this is what's beneath. And, and the stinger stings, it's over. The clock melts, the leaves fall. Or the doomsday clock gets to <laughs> that's 12. Right. That's right, yeah. They say we're two minutes to 12. Yeah. Well, that's another subject. So yeah. let's move on to uh, the octaratist. Yes. The octaratist. The Octorist. Yeah. Octorist. Oh, no, that's actually this painting. I'm sorry, Natura, Natura Absconditus. Abscondita. Abscondita. Yeah, that again, sounds more Spanish. Yeah, it's actually a Latin phrase, mm -hmm. and, and it translates as hidden nature. And what we're dealing with here, uh, it, my motivation was, again, uh, to, to express something of the interconnectedness of things, that we're all connected to nature. But as you can see, the, the, the faces are split apart, that nature is at the center of our being. And it's really the, the driving force within us. 
And that uh, looking at it also in the pyramid shape is, is going back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs in the, in the seven sections of the pyramid where the head is the top, but the top is self-actualization. Mm -hmm. So the expression of nature being at the center and the head, nature being at the top, where we self-actualize as human beings. And uh, in the center of the thing, I see roots, kind of. I didn't see that before. Well, that, uh, they're actually flowers. And again, you see a lot of flowers, and there's a lot of nature, and there's also sort of abstract symbols, not that they necessarily mean anything other than the fact that they're material objects combined with nature. Mm -hmm. and so it's, it's a combination of all those things. Uh, it's interesting that your paintings are the kind of paintings that help to get some kind of expression of if you can't read them yourself, you know, when you go to the gallery or something. Well, that's what I think you hope for that, at least I do. Uh, I, I believe that you want the, the viewer, whoever they are, to kind of stop and go, even if they don't stay long, but if mm -hmm. they stop and, and try to say, what's, what's happening here, you know? If it, it does a little shift of consciousness, then you've succeeded on some level. Mm, I think you do that. So let's uh, take a look at, the, I like this one, the Octeratist. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's again, you know, we were talking about the woman and the guitar. Now, yeah. if you'll, you'll look, there is a guitar in here. Uh, it's, it's kind of strapped on the back in a very surrealistic way. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I was house sitting with a, a, a friend's house, and she's this fabulous guitar player, a technical wizard, really. And I, and I did some sketches while I was there because she had guitars everywhere. And, and of course, my wife playing the guitar. I'm surrounded by guitars, you know, with women with guitars. So, but they were so technically astute that I thought, well, here it is. It's like they have many hands, right? Mm -hmm. You know, many tentacles. And that was kind of the inspiration of that. But like I was telling you earlier, it, I didn't want to make anything completely realistic. It had to have that fantasy element in there, very surreal element. Was this woman uh, who you uh, modeled that after? Was she a classical guitarist? And no, I actually uh, sort of a rock, jazz really? fusion, yes, right, and, um, uh, but just technically brilliant, mm -hmm. technically brilliant, but, but the, the, the image is not, you know, taken after her, it was inspired by her technical e expertise. Oh, very interesting yeah. piece. All right, let's move <clears throat> on to your, the last piece of art we have, Amazonia. Yeah, again, it's, it's that same theme, and mm -hmm. um, it, it was inspired, I did one of the sketches uh, when I was at the house, and, uh, and, and initially it was, I was trying to make this surrealistic guitar, again, with all the tentacles around her, same kind of idea as the, as the previous painting, uh, but, but I, as I was creating the guitar, it began to look something like a spear, and she began to look something like a, an Amazonian warrior, mm -hmm. and then I thought, oh, this is like, woman is an artist warrior, mm -hmm. and so it was, the, it was the, the, the expression of that, the amazing talent, and, uh, and the little balls all around there are like the amazing juggling act of making all this beautiful music happening. Mm. So she plays, does she play just the guitar, the banjo, and other things too? Well, she, she's primarily a guitarist, the woman we're talking about, and also, you know, my wife who plays both the guitar and the piano. Mm -hmm. And I, I look at them and, and with a certain degree of awe, you know, yeah. at their technical skills, and, mm -hmm. and that's what this inspiration for these paintings are. I think most people don't realize how technically skilled a lot of even the rock musicians of the past and present are. Uh, and even more so today because, yeah. you know, young people coming up are exposed to so much more music and the ability to get access to it quicker than it was when, when I was growing up. Do you like the whole idea of talking about music? So you like the old idea of world fusion music? I like the idea. Yeah. I like the idea of fusion because it's... It takes successful genres and, and puts them in new ways, the innovation aspect of that, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I noticed that there's a lot of um, new uh, African blending. Not that there wasn't, you Masakela died recently. Oh yeah. And uh, within the last week, I think. And he was an absolutely great musician and he was like the top musician in Africa for a long time. And, uh, but he got involved in fusion. I think he was 68 when he died, he just died. Mm -hmm and definitely a king of, of that kind of music in South Africa. But yeah. he worked with Americans, too, to do this a lot mixing of great, and blending. A yeah. lot of great music has come out of that, yeah. that, that continent. Yeah, yeah and absolutely. currently. Yeah, uh, you and, know, currently. and ongoing, yeah. But I, I think, of course, I mean, you can look at going back to the blues came out of you know, that. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah, it was a mixture, too. But, uh, you know, the, fabulous, this idea of fusing these, these genres together. Um, the current fusing, yeah. yeah. That's right. 
Okay, well, uh, other you also, not only are you a musician, uh, which you, you used to play in a band, right? Play, well, we, I played in several, but, uh, you know, mm -hmm. these are, we're going back a few years now, yeah, so. And you want to do it again? I'm not actually, you know, getting ready to take it out at some point. I'm not sure when, but it shouldn't be too long. I've been mm -hmm. trying to get my chops back. Yeah, okay, <laughs> we won't say anything about that. That could be a, that could be a comment. Another, another time. Another yeah. time. Yeah. But you also do some writing in your past which you could explain that you were uh, doing some screenplay writing and uh, that I know of, and also you have two books and one draft, and maybe we can get the, one of the covers up for the book, uh, the first book, there you go, Phase Out. Mm -hmm. What's that to study? Well, it, well, Phase Out is really sort of a futuristic novel. It's about, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of an extension of where we are today with a, with a powerful corporation sort of running everything. You know, they're the, they're the face behind, you know, the government really because they're, they're putting the, the, the coins in the pockets of those who run the show. But um, uh, is this, this is, did you do the graphics of this? Uh, I, I actually did help do the graphics. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, Beautifully done, by the, the way. The, the book is about uh, a search for a new fossil fuel, helium-3, which is primarily, we're discovering, is on the moon. So it's about a battle of corporations battling to control helium-3 in a war on, on the moon. Now, that's a simple way of saying it. It's much more complex than that, but, uh, but it is a science fiction novel. You know, it's all of this, uh, that kind of science fiction, it's not that far out of the world because just the other day, there was a conclusion to the battle between uh, Google and Uber. Did you know about that? I've heard about it. On a yeah. $200 million settlement. Yeah. You know, just because one of the executives of uh, Google, which was another company, I forget its name, went over to Uber, and uh, Uber wanted that technology that Google had. So it's kind of like your story there. Yeah, yeah come to life in front of us. Yeah, it's, it's who wants to get the best information first and so they can market it and profit by it. Right? Well, this is all so, so we're talking about self-driving cars here. Yeah, yeah. Which is, um, you know, future technology yeah. and present. Well, in, in, my, in my book, In Face Out, they, we're dealing with future warfare too, and so there's a lot of different elements there mm -hmm. about the, the world to come, what it might be like. Yeah, your, your version of, of what, the movie series now, anything? Blade Runner, maybe a little bit. Oh, and there could be a tad of Blade Runner. It's more about you know, again, about corporate takeovers, corporate power, mm -hmm. psychic warfare, different types of warfare that aren't even you know invented yet. It's my vision of what might be. So we'll never see that in NBC. <laughs> no, you won't. All right, maybe we can take a shot of the next uh, uh, picture. There we go, of the well, screen. This, this is screenwriting, right? Yeah, well this is a book that I actually was uh, a contributor to. Uh, it came out several years ago, and um, I, you know, I was working in Hollywood as a screenwriter for a number of years. And, uh, and this book, actually, I, I'm among several other different people in here. We're writing about the craft of screenwriting and the business of screenwriting, mm -hmm. what it is like as a business. It's actually a book that is a self-help book for people who are interested in the screenwriting world. Is that book out? Or it is out, yeah, it's been out for several years, yeah. And you can get it in? You can get it, uh, play with all, it. yeah, anywhere. Okay, I like that. Uh, was there another graphic that we missed on the books? I, the the uh, yeah, this one right here. Okay. Yeah. Talk this, about that a little bit. Well, this was uh, initially this is a, an adventure story, a fantasy adventure story that actually was initially a screenplay that I actually tried to sell to Hollywood, mm -hmm. but because I actually wanted to introduce young people to Shakespeare, uh, they, they were afraid. Hollywood was afraid of it. They were afraid people because because a lot of the dialogue is sort of written in a slang version of Elizabethan language, you know, mm -hmm. it's iambic pentameter, you know, it's, it's all sort of lyrical in the way it's written, and, mm. uh, but yet it's an adventure story. Mm. Sounds really fascinating. Yeah, I, well, I thought it was a good idea, you know, to both help kids, expose kids to Shakespeare and also to give them the entertainment value of a fantasy adventure. Uh, do you think that entertainment value is something that's really needed these days with young people in think, order to get them interested in a book like that? Well, I think it helps, but I think we're getting too much of it in the sense that it's all, uh, you know, it's all, the content is not there. I mean, we're getting the gloss on the top, but not the real meat of something that's more important. Sort of like with, along with fake lies and fake <laughs> this, <laughs> fake books, fake Fake everything, books, yeah. fake everything, that's yeah. right. Well, yeah. too much data, really. Yeah. And it's hard uh, from what the 
uh, good news people that are left talk about is that uh, the data that we were getting can be created by almost anybody. And when it's created by anybody, uh, you, it's hard to tell if it's true or false. Yeah, and you don't know where the, your data is coming from any longer. I mean, because you, mm -hmm. you, you get online and, and it's, it, you read something, and is it real? Is it fake? Who put it out? You know, who's mm -hmm. behind it? You don't know. You don't know. Um, so we see this last book cover. So where do you see yourself going in society, the, particularly the way you <laughs> depict it and visualize it mm -hmm. in art and music? Where do you think you are going? Where do you think the society is going? Yeah. Because uh, you're obviously a critic of society. Well, society is, is, is a hard one to nail. But, I, but it, starting with me, I mean, my, my contribution, if you want to call it that, is, is I want to continue to create. And, and, and I love writing. I love painting. I love the music. So I, I, I've been doing these things all my life. So I, I'm going to continue that journey. I, I'm hoping, as far as my artistic life goes, that I can create product that's actually a little more meaningful, and that, that sheds a, a, maybe a little bit brighter light on, on the human condition. So as an artist, that's, that's where I am right now. Um, society looks pretty rough, you know. I mean, the way the, way the culture is going right now, the whole political situation in the world, it, 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 it makes me sad. And uh, so, uh, but I think as an artist, it's part of our job to help, you know, to try to make that in whatever small way we can you know, to make some sort of change or awareness, at least, of the possibility of change for a better life. <laughs> to make sense out of the stuff that's nonsensical, yeah, the, maybe. Yeah, the, the, the craziness, the yeah. mania that's out there, yeah. I notice, too, that you're very much involved in all your, or most of your paintings, with nature and the value of nature in its contribution to uh, human wholeness. Can you comment on that? Well, yeah, I, and I think that because we, we are part of nature, we are the same thing, you know, and, and we don't pay enough attention, attention to that, you know. We're, we're, we're becoming less and less introspective, and we have to quiet down, I believe. We have to take time out for silence, meditation, introspection, time to spend with nature, and because uh, and, it feeds us. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, that's, that's a greater source of information in a way than, than what we're getting all the da data output from here, outside of us. Yeah, I was um, proof of that is, you know, you read every day of some magnificent thing that the scientists and designers, engineers, and electrical people, artists too, are doing with nature. And I just saw something and read something about uh, ancient uh, use of uh, shark scales and how, <laughs> yeah, and how you think, well, art, what do you do with that? That's not well, a new musical scale. No, no. <laughs> art, the scales, it turns out the design of that ancient creature, yeah. a white shark and the scales, helped to re reduce the drag on a plane. They're now figuring out that they Amazing. can reduce the, and increase this fuel capacity and make everything more efficient. So there are things going on, and they're using those scales on a shark and designing around that. That's I, amazing. Uh, whoever yeah. thought of that, you know? Yeah. yeah. Mind-boggling, right. Mind-boggling. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lot of things coming to us uh, through design and science. Uh, you write about in this, the fantasy book, what was the name of that again? Well, not in the fantasy book, but in the Phase Out, which phase is, out, is yeah. a science fiction book, yeah. Sounds like a book worth reading. Maybe. Yeah. You should check it out. Uh, I will. Yeah, I will. <laughs> you can get it. Where can you get it? You can get it at all the, the local locations. You can get it at Amazon, you know, Barnes Noble. Okay. Any, anywhere. Okay. Or if you might know a guy that might even have a copy. Yeah, that's right. I do. <laughs> well, uh, what I want to do is thank you for uh, being here and uh, being uh, showing your wonderful work here and letting the public be aware of you and you know, your contribution to the society and world, because it is, and I agree with you, I think uh, culturally we have to do that. And so we hear from people like you with the background you have and the inspiration you have, both in writing and uh, pictures, uh, film, and uh, other forms, that you, music. So anyway, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank the audience for participating in the show. Um, and uh, it's on every uh, Monday and Thursday at 6.30. It's called In Their Words, which is 
while we're both here. I want to thank the crew, all of you wonderful crew, the director, and uh, I want to thank the graphics people, sound people, for the kind of work they do, and thank RVTV for allowing community television to communicate to you and you about the show, okay, and what we do. Thank you very much, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you.